The great Kenny Monday's back on the podcast. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing good. Doing good. Getting better every day. And Getting you were just saying this is the best time for wrestling that you can remember. In my lifetime. In my lifetime. I truly believe that. Just with all the the opportunities that, that wrestlers have and coaches have to to study. And, I mean, every, yeah, every, every match you can pretty much see. Every wrestler, you can pretty much pull them up, Google them, YouTube them. You know, you can watch wrestlers from all over the world. And I think it's changed the world all across the world. Like, other countries can now see wrestling. So, back in the day when we were coming up, you, you either had to be there, you had videotape. You know, you can get some tape. But that footage was kind of hard to get sometimes. You know, now it's easy to get. You know, I was just watching Snyder and those guys wrestle, um, you know, from the, from the tournament the other day. And, I mean, you, you see everything, right? I'm recruiting kids. The kids call me up and say, Coach, you know, I'm doing this. As, you know, I'm a state champ. Da, da, da. So I put their name in and I can pull them right up, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, you can't only really lie about your, 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 uh, your record these days. You can't, can't lie. So I can, I can just Google it, pull it up. And so I think it's that. And um, I think with the creation of the, of the club teams, you know, it was a different thing. I mean, I think that's, that's changed the game of wrestling. I think it's revolutionized the game of wrestling because we were coming up, we didn't have, we had teams and club teams, but, but it's different now, right? I mean, you can actually make a living um, like a karate school. I remember coming out of college and my college coach, Tommy Chesbro, asked me what I wanted to do after, after I finished school. And I said, man, I, I really would like to do a, a wrestling academy. And it was just in my mind. Like, this is what I was thinking. I grew up with, with, you know, karate schools, like I said, they were everywhere, you know, and they, and they sustained business for years. Um, and I knew right away that wrestling was the best month your life. So those karate kids, I just take them down and they couldn't get up, right? So, like, wrestling is the best social, it's the best self-defense, right? That, that's kind of what kept me in the sport. But I was like, man, I, could, I, could, I want to start an academy and, you know, start a kid from wrestling and just take them all the way up through high school, you know, send them to college, bring them back up to college, um, you know, and then train them for the Olympic Games, you know. So that was kind of the vision that I had, and it's kind of happening. You know? So the guys are now, you know, they're, they're running businesses, you know, that, that uh, sustain. And kids and, and parents and kids are paying. They understand that. To, and everyone's looking for an edge. You know, but baseball's been doing it for a long time. Um, you know, the hockey, you know, they do it, you know, gymnastics, they do it. So I think wrestling was just kind of late to the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because yeah, like you said, those, those academies are everywhere now. Yeah. Now, yeah. Absolutely. On top of, uh, on top of all the good things that are happening in wrestling, how do you feel about the current rule set and folk style? Are we good or we do, do we need to tinker there? Cause every year about this time, people start yeah. bringing something up and once in a while I'll buy into it and I'll get on the, the right. train right. Of, of changing something. But I think in general, we have to step back a little bit more and be more positive about how good attendance is and how good yeah. the coverage is. But how are you feeling about the folk style rules these days? I think the rules are good if, if they're implemented in the in, implemented in the right way. I think the referees has got, they have to do a better job at being consistent. I think some of the problems we get into you know, I think the referees will go back from, you know, they're coaching kids, they're coaching high school, then they're coaching college. And those are two, three different, different games, right? Three different things, the way you should call a match. You can't, you know, go from high school and get into college and not call stalling and the kid is stalling backing up. And you just, you can't call it the same way. Right. And so mm -hmm. the, the rules are, you know, that that's, 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 I see, I see that as a problem that has to be, you know, uh, rectified. Um, and I think, I think the rules are good. I think the rules are good. I don't, I don't, riding time has always kind of been a, um, a sore spot for me. I don't think, I, I think David Taylor had it out the other day and I was, I've been thinking about that too. Um, I don't think you should get a riding time until you got the kid on his back. <laughs> if you got the kid yeah. on his back, then riding time should be accumulated. You know, as far as just holding on to somebody, you know, cause it's, it's so subjective and, you know, you, you cause it's, it's contradictory, right? Because you're 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 getting penalized for holding the guy down, you're you know stalling. But then you get a point. So if I if I got 15 seconds left to get riding time, I'm not going to try to take a risk and turn the guy. I'm just trying to hold on to him. Mm -hmm. But then I get penalized. I get penalized for that, right? And there's times where you you know you you can't be trying to pin the guy, take that kind of risk when you're trying to get riding time. So I think it's uh, I think it's kind of a contradictory rule. But I think wrestling would be better if you 
we changed that rule there, you know? So, yeah. And for folks who didn't see the tweet, David was uh, exactly, as you said, you know, you have to turn someone to get the writing time point. And he right. had a few others in there as well. And uh, I know even Adam Terrapelli, who's a, who's a big guy on Twitter. He's, yeah, yeah. He says uh, he likes the push out rule in folk style. Yeah. You like that? Uh, I'm not sold on that one. I'm not sold on that one either. I think, you know, cause then you'll get in the guys just kind of pushing them out of bounds and, um, I think I think the referees have just got to make them wrestle. They just got to make them wrestle, um, and and so, you know. But but for for a guy like me and my whole career, right? Once I got to a level that where I was the best guy and I was the number one guy, and, and you know guys were trying to stall and and just keep the match close, then I get it, right? So guys will, will play the edge. Mm-hmm. Guys will play the edge on you. So that's where that rule comes in. You know, by the time you get to the guy, he's out of bounds, right? My night to Olympic final, that guy ran around. We ran around the mat. I'm chasing him. I get to a leg finally, and we're out of bounds, right? So it's like guys will play the edge, right, just yeah. to, just to, to keep from getting taken down and keeping the match close. And that's what you do. If, you, if you, you're not at the level of that guy, how do you keep yourself in the match? Well, you play the edge. You play the edge. You play the edge. You go back and watch Spencer Lee and uh, the kid from Arizona State. Courtney? Uh, and, in the finals. Yeah. And that's all Courtney did. He just played the edge, played the edge. And by the time Spencer got to him, he's off the mat, right? That kind of kept him in the match mm-hmm. until Spencer started turning on. But, but yeah, so I, I think, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a argument to be, to be, you know, had with that because guys will play the edge, you know, and of course they did it on me a lot and mm-hmm. kept him in the match, you know? So yeah, I think that, that could be, and I like it in freestyle. I do. Freestyle is good right now. Freestyle is in a good place. And freestyle is in a good place, man. And you know what's good? What's great about it is they're not changing. Like when Fila was in, that's why we almost lost wrestling because Fila was so corrupt and they were changing rules every every month. And every time the, the, the Americans would get good at, at something, they change it. Mm-hmm. Right? I remember the time where we were, they, they changed the rule on part tier where you, you had to, you couldn't take, you couldn't turn a guy twice with the same move. Right. And so we had just got good. I mean, Bruce Bob got it was like gut wrenching people were turning people, turning people, got good at, at parterre. Then they changed the rule where you could you could only turn them once, then you had to go to another side. So you had to go gut wrench and go to a lace, then back to a gut wrench. You know, so it was like crazy. So every time we get good at something, they would change the rule. And now we're good at we're, I mean they haven't changed the rule and we're starting to kind of dominate. We're starting to kind of really um, take control of these matches. And it's so good to see our guys you know, competing overseas and, and winning, right? Because you just didn't see a whole lot of that, that, you know, when we were coming up, you had a few guys would win, but then not every, we have, we have good showings now. Now, what was the year? Did you ever go to Tbilisi? I went to, you yeah, twice. I went 87 and 88. You won it in both times? I won in 88. Per- no, 88. I okay. won in 88. Dave Schultz won it in 87 in my weight class. I got fifth. Yep. Wow. I got fifth. And you know, it was, it was a great trip because you know, you get 10, 12 matches in on that trip, on that tour, because what we, it's changed now, but what we would do, we would go uh, a few days early before the tournament. We'd do dual meets. We have three dual meets with Russian teams um, uh, preceding the, 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 the Tbilisi tournament. So we'd have a dual meet, and, and all those guys were like top, top level Russians, right? And everybody was trying to make the, the, the team. And so you get, you get the best guys trying to get their, their name out there. They could beat an American, and they would have a good argument to be on that team. And so we'd have two, dual, three dual meets, and then we go into the tournament. I remember my, the year I won it, I had 10 matches. I was 10-0 and 0 on the tour. Wow. Yeah, I, was 10, I, didn't, I didn't lose on that tour. The year before that, I got beat by a couple guys that I beat the, the next year. Um, but the year 87, I went, and that really kind of changed my life and really helped me to understand how to beat Russians, right, and really how to – um, how to train for them, and, and that really it helped me to close a lot of gaps. My, you go back and watch my matches from 1987, and then watch my matches in 1988. Man, it's just two different people almost. I made I made a huge huge jump from 87 to 88. A lot of it was due to going to Russia and wrestling those matches, and then uh, understanding um, how to train. You know, then of course the next year I won it, and then Dave was on the tour. But he didn't wrestle. He just mm. kind of he just went. He just went to kind of you know be over there, and, and um, I don't know if he was just wanted to watch me or something because I was coming. I was starting to 
close the gap on him, right? And uh, so he went to, but but it was good for me because when he saw me win that term, his eyes were like, you know, oh shit, this kid, <laughs> this dude is <laughs> this dude is really coming. If he can win this term, he's really coming. So, so when you really said kind of, you said when you went in eighty seven that it changed changed your life and changed your perspective. So was it the getting to wrestle and feel those guys was, or was it also yeah. looking at what life was like in the Soviet system during that time? Cause a lot of people say it was pretty bleak back then. Absolutely. It was KGB, man. It was KGB. And I saw wrestlers never be the same after to listen because the conditions were bad. You know, you couldn't eat after six, seven o'clock at night. You know, you couldn't drink the water really you couldn't trust the water. So you had, you, you know, we had to bring like our own little snacks or food, like, granola bars and oatmeal hot plates and you would try to do as much as you can on your own to keep from eating their food right mm -hmm. because and you couldn't trust it right you couldn't trust some of the stuff so yeah it was it was, it was a tough trip man it's a tough trip because it was cold you know the gyms were cold um you know i mean you couldn't you i never got warm until i was in the sauna <laughs> <laughs> like it's sleeping and you slept with your 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 uh sweats on you, you were cold when you wrestled, and the only the only hot hot area was in the sauna. So that's the only time you warmed up. The cold, the showers were cold. Now, it's, a, it's a it's a tough. It was a tough trip. It's a brutal trip. Um, and then <clears throat> you're wrestling the best guys. It's like now it was the Soviet Union, and so um, you didn't have all the you know the countries that were broken up. Like right? still Russia. Everybody's trying to make the you know the Soviet team. And so you would have to go through all those guys, you know, to, to get to the top. And I mean, I'd be a couple of world champions on my way through. So it was, it was a, it was a good tournament. Who was the, the big dog Russian at the time, Varayev or was Fedzayev? Not your way. But, but it was Varayev, you know, because Fedzayev was at 49.5. He, he was the weight class below me. So I never even wrestled him until he came up. But yeah, Varayev was the guy, um, Gajikonov, Mega Man. That was there was three or four. Zagudov. Zagudov was really tough. It was it was it was three or four that was like really one or two points away from each other. On mm -hmm. any given day, either one of them could win. But Varyev was probably had the edge on 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 those guys. He was he was probably the best. But but they would wrestle one two point matches. But he just came out on top of them. But yeah, that Zagudov was tough. I beat Zagudov in the in the 87 world no it was 86 87 world cup we had it was so funny 87 world cup was in mongolia because they because it was in ohio every year right the world cup was in ohio every year how we doing um, that's kennedy you see my son kennedy how you doing kennedy <laughs> what's, up? what's up we're recording a podcast yeah yeah he, he can't oh, remember yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but anyway so we um the world cup was in mongolia one year, I think uh, uh, the, the director of the World Cup, because it was in Ohio every year, um, and then he, I think he passed away. So they moved it that year to Mongolia. That's and, a rough uh, place. It was really so cold. It was probably the coldest place I've ever been in my life. <laughs> and I had Zagudov in the finals, and I beat him in the finals. And so that was the time I won the, the World Cup. But uh, And he was really – and then I beat him in the finals of Tbilisi. In 88. In the final, in 88. So who did Dave beat when he won it in 87? He beat Mega Madoff. Mega Madoff, and I beat him in 88. I beat him in the – it was in the, the semifinal. I had him in the semis. I beat him in the semis when I won it, and Dave beat him in the finals when he won it. Wow, that's cool. It that... was a tough move, though. It was, it was a tough move. It was a tough move. <laughs> he had legs in it. He get like a, a full hat, a full Nelson on him, and then turn him and pin him. <laughs> There's a full yeah. Nelson. It's a legal move. <laughs> I had to hurt but, so bad to have Dave on top of you with oh, legs dude. and wrenching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did it on – he tried that on me in our finals trials match. But we caught it. We were, we were, we were we <laughs> caught it. We said, hey, yeah, yeah, it's illegal. It's illegal. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Brave, Dave was uh, – I've never felt pain from anyone in my life other than Dave. So I was probably just like technique pain. Like he would he would put legs in on the turn year or he would – grab your arm and do a Kimura. He had some things that, that was really painful and he, yeah. and he liked it. <laughs> he liked it. Now, when you're going to an event like, like the world cup in Mongolia or, you know, going to uh, Tbilisi in Georgia, 
are you cutting all the weight before you get on the plane or are you getting on the plane knowing you got a battle of weight cut when you get there under not ideal circumstances? No, you got the weight's got to be under control when you get on the plane, you know? Um, of course, you know, some guys would, you know, we, you know, at that, at that time I, I could lose, you know, seven, eight pounds in, in an hour. Um, so just water weight, but no, weight's got to be under control if you hit those. Cause you just never know. One, you never know the conditions. You never know if it's going to be a sauna. You never know if the room's going to be hot. You know, so you just never know about those those um, conditions before you go. So you got to be, you know, on weight or close to weight, or you're not going to have a good performance. Right? You just can't depend on it, right? So you you got to be, um, you know, got to have the weight under control. Wow, for sure. Yeah, that, that and, I've had some, I've, and I've had a couple. Yeah, and I've had a couple. You know, I can't say I was perfect at it. Right? I've had a couple situations where I, you know. I, I was too heavy getting there, you know, but it worked out because that's always like after the holidays too, right? Because January <laughs> is the time you, when you, that's when you normally you're wrestling overseas. The, the first part of January, that's right after Christmas and their whole thing, New Year's. And, so it's not a good time, but uh, it's experience. So, you know, the first year I went to Tbilisi, that's what I'm saying. I, I learned a lot. I learned about, I learned what to expect. I learned what to expect. I knew what, I knew the conditions were going to be good. I knew it was going to be cold. Um, I know, I knew, you know, my warm ups had to be good, you know, getting ready. So it just, it was just experience to get ready for the next Would year. Would you say that tournament had a bigger impact on you or the NCAA tournament as a freshman was a bigger turning point for you? To Blissey. To Blissey. Yeah. And they both, they both were, but to Blissey was, um, yeah, to Blissey was probably the bigger one just because the stakes, the stakes were bigger. Um, and, you know, it wasn't so much the, the, the wrestling part of the NCAAs. That was more of maturity. And just, I was a kid. I just didn't, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't ready. Um, I was cutting too much weight. Uh, and I got bigger. That story, I, that's a whole different story. Let's hear it. I got bigger. Well, my freshman year, I go in um, wrestling 142. I showed up on campus, went about 150, 151. And, but every year after my... In, in my, I went my high school career. I wrestled 108 my freshman year, 108 my freshman year. My sophomore year, I was up to 123. My, my junior year, I was up to 136. My senior year, I was up to 148. And so I grew 10 pounds. Every year after the state tournament, I get a, a 10 pound bump. And the state tournament is in February, right? And so the next year, I'm wrestling 142 and, and cutting pretty good weight. Um, get to the tournament in March. And I, well, actually in February, I got bigger and, and I, I went to school. I was, my shoe size was eight when I went to, when I went to college. February, I was wearing a nine. I couldn't wear the, I'm <laughs> speaking, all of a sudden my, my shoes were tight. I'm like, damn, all my shoes are tight. I, I couldn't figure it out. Like, dang, these shoes are too small. So I had to get a bigger size. And so I was wearing a nine come, come March, right? And so Chesbro was like, Kenny, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm coach, I'm not doing anything. I just, I just grew 10 pounds. And then, so the weight cut was really tough, and I, and I just didn't, I didn't recover in that, in that match. I was seated fourth going in as a as a freshman. Um, I had a pretty good record my freshman year. I only lost four times, and I ended up losing the quarterfinals, twelve to a crazy match. It was like thirteen or eleven, and then I, I lost in the blood round, and you know, or the next round, and went out. So it was uh, sorry, it was so that was just a tough. But that was that was just maturity. The 87, that Russian tour was more, that was more uh, technical uh, training habits, um, those kind of things. You know, I knew my training changed. Uh, you know, the, the things I worked on changed, my studying changed, and my lifting changed, you know, so things changed just as far as just uh, getting, getting better as a wrestler. How did the training change? Like in terms of like, you're not running as much, you're working on this more, or was it more like very technical stuff? More technical stuff, more freestyle, more freestyle, freestyle positions, not giving up, giving up, you know, my, my hand fight, not giving up, uh, you know, I mean, they were big at, you know, two on ones and um, front head locks and that kind of thing. And just, just, yeah, this technical stuff, my finishes, you know, getting my finishes, not getting cross lift, not getting taken through that kind of thing. So I, I didn't, I never wrestled freestyle through college. I never wrestled freestyle in the summertime. I think only my freshman year I did. 
I think I tried to make the junior world. I made the junior world team. I didn't go, but I made the team. Um, but I would just work. I would just work in the summers um, and just work out folk style. I never wrestled freestyle. So when I finished college in 84, that was a big gap in my, in my freestyle wrestling. There was a big gap that I had to close. And then so, you know, my track started from after 84, 85, 86, 87. That's when I developed. And, and I really didn't hit, hit my peak until I got to 88. <laughs> until January of 88 after that, Tbilisi. when I came back from Tbilisi, I was confident that I could, I could win. I could beat everybody in the world. And like I any... Any great American, though, at the time, your first hill was getting past another American, right? And that was right. a that's a, always the big step for a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was me. It was really the, the, when it came down to it, it was me, Dave, and Nate Carr in the weight class uh, at one sixty three, seventy four kilos. And we were the ones that were battling out to make it. We we're all great wrestlers, all world class wrestlers. Um, had to get past Nate. Kind of got past Nate first. And then I, had to, then I had to get past uh, Dave, of course. But uh, Nate was a, kind of the first hurdle. <laughs> and that's a that's a five hour conversation. You exactly. and Nate Carr. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I had uh, Mike Sheets on recently, and he was talking about yeah, I how. Yeah, saw that. Yeah, yeah he's the that. best, cool. Matt. He said in uh, yeah. 87, 88, you guys were literally just like your own coaches working out at a middle yeah. school. Yep. Is that? Yep, I mean, did. that's we what did. it was. Absolutely, we. Now Joe was there. Joe Say was a head coach, and Bruce Burnett was 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 an assistant coach. But Bruce was he he came to Oklahoma State from a high school, so he was a high school coach, and he was a good coach. But he but he we knew more than him, to be honest. Um, and so he would just like keep the clock, or you know you know kind of help us drive us off. You know he was just kind of an assistant helping us through. But yeah, we were pretty much coaching each other, even with John in the room. We were pretty much coaching each other. I mean, I remember working on John's low singles when he came back from that, that tournament in Topeka, when he lost to Randy Lewis, we came back and we were like, dude, you, you gotta, you gotta stand on that dude's hips now. You gotta stand on his hips. You gotta hit him low where he can't get to your crotch. You gotta come up, you know, and, and he started doing a crack down. He got good at the crack down and he got that from Dave Schultz. His, John got that crack down and his ankle lace from Dave Schultz. Wow. I don't know if people know that, but that's, he got it. Cause he made the, he made the world team in 87. I lost to Dave in 87. We would both could have made it, but I was in his corner in 87, and John was in my corner against Dave in 87 in the world team trials, right? So Because wow. we were coaching each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, he made the team, and that was the, 87 was the first time I beat Dave. I beat Nate twice, two straight. And then I lost to Nate in the, uh, Dave in the finals uh, in 87. But we, we were coaching each other. But we came back from that tournament, and we were working on his crack downs and, and, and his low singles. Did you, you, go, you go back and watch it. Did you go to France in 87 and watch that Worlds, or did you not make no, the No, no, no. I was at home. I was at home. <laughs> I stayed home. I didn't know. Stayed if home they, and trained. If, they, uh, no. if he brought you as he a went, workout. No, he wouldn't bring me as a workout partner. It was more competitive. Go, <laughs> yeah, I, went, I didn't want to go. I was pissed off. It was a loss. So now I was uh, – because I was coming, I was I was getting better. That was the first time, the first year I beat him. Out of the first, because I lost him in '86, lost him in '85. That was the first year I, I, I beat him, and so I was I, I knew I could beat him. I just had to get better, better shape, and and kind of stay out of his good stuff, you know. So, what? yeah, we I, re, I remember working with John on his low singles. Well, that match is legendary. Um, Topeka, Kansas, spring of '88. Randy Lewis yeah. has been off the mat for a long yeah. time. He yeah. comes in, John's you know the reigning world champ, and yep. yeah, throws him, goes up her body with him, yep. and he gets thrown. Yep. And man, that's a that's yeah, a historic yeah. moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, John came up on a high crotch and came up trying to go around his body, and that's you know that's right in, in Randy's wheelhouse, you know. <laughs> and uh, Randy, Randy was so dang. He was one of he's one of my favorite wrestlers, and watching him grow up, and he was so dangerous, man. And we were around the same time, a little older than me, but he was. Always looking to, to, to score points and throw you on your head. He was so dangerous. And, but yeah, from that match, that changed John, right? We came back. I beat I beat Dave in that tournament. Right? Wow. And that set the yep, that set the ladder. That set the ladder to the final Olympic trials in in uh in um in Florida. And so yeah, we came back from that match. Um and, and we started working, he started working on his crackdowns, working on his singles, and then you go back and watch the final trials and to be in, in Florida, 
And, and um, what was it? Uh, yeah, I couldn't think of it either when you were saying that. Uh, so Roy Jones is from that area. He's from that town. Forget about all of it. But anyway, it's in Florida. And then so we went back and, yep, started working on his low singles, working on his misdirections, um, working on the crackdowns. And, uh, yeah, so we definitely we, – we coached each other. You know, and then right when I saw stuff, I was hey, John, I think you need to be here. You know, his misdirection, you know, he won't, he won't admit to it, but I taught him that misdirection. <laughs> and then, um, and then Sheets, you know, Sheets, you know, Sheets was, Sheets pin marked in that tournament. And, um, and so we thought we were both, we, we thought all three of us were going to make the team, to be honest. We really did. Man. We really did. And, and he got to, he got to uh, Pensacola. Got to Pensacola, man, and, and just Mark had the freaking he had the match of his life. He just, you know, and he Mark was great. Mark was Mark was a great wrestler, man. And um he just he he had he had two of the best matches I've ever seen him wrestle. And that's people don't, Sheets. people don't realize that Sheets took a couple years off and he gets serious about it, goes to Eureka with you yeah. and takes yeah. a match off of Mark Schultz. And you know, we hear so much about Dave and and as we should, but from what I hear from, I can't remember who's telling me it. Someone who wrestled Mark was like, man, Mark Schultz, he had the kind of the, a little bit of the mind of Dave and the technique, but a, a freakish body, like a, like yeah. a real athlete's body. I mean, what was oh, he yeah. like back then? He was amazing. And I, and I didn't never, I've never wrestled him in a match, but of course, once we made the team in 88, we, we trained together, right? We wrestled, you know, a few times in practice. And um, and so as we were trying to train for him, right? I had to, I studied him, right? Watched him, trying to get help sheets, um, and so we watched him, watched him a lot, and knew what he had, and that kind of thing. But I tell you a quick story. It was it was the last last workout before the Olympic Games started in '88, and me and Mark were scheduled to wrestle that day, right? And I'd been off the mat for probably two or three days, three days, because I had twisted I had a, a twist in my knee. I, was, I kind of was off the mat for three days, just, you know, biking and that kind of thing. And so I wanted to wrestle that day because it was really my last time. And so, it was, of course, back then it was 10 guys in the weight on the team. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, our area, they had cubicles for each country and time slots to train. And so we had, we had this one cubicle, and it was one really one mat, one and a half mats. So it really wasn't a lot of space. And I wanted to open up. I wanted to go, I wanted to go balls to the wall, just really open up. Because I was, you know, the tournament started in a couple of days. And so me and Mark was going to wrestle, and then I'm looking around and we're trying to start a drill. And I'm like, man, this isn't gonna work. This is because people were running on people, and that whole thing. I'm like, and I was pissed off. I'm like, this isn't gonna work. We, I need some space. And so Dave was in the room, right? <laughs> so Dave, being Dave, said, I'll be back, I'll be back. So he ran down. And he did something with the with the Korean team and got them out of the cubicle, right? I don't know if he paid them. I don't know what he did. But he came back and said, hey, come on, I got you. <laughs> so <laughs> we go to this cubicle. We go to this cubicle, and we're the only ones in the gym. We were the only ones in the cubicle, right? So he ran them off some kind of way. I don't know how he did it. He, he might have paid them. You know, he had DuPont money at that point, so he may have paid them. <laughs> so it was just me, Dave, and Mark in this freaking cubicle, right? A whole map by himself. I'm loving it. So, man, we went for like an hour and a half, just straight freaking brawling and um, just going, right? I mean, not a lot of scoring going on, but we were, I mean, I was, we were close. And so I duck him one time and I get him up, I duck him, I get him a body lock, and man, I'm, I'm about to plant him. I mean, all of our feet are off the ground, we're suspended in the air, and all of a sudden he kind of does like a hip height motion and landed. You know, it was a four point stance. And I was like, and air, he, he like freaking, a cat. Yeah, yeah, and air, he freaking twisted. I thought I was going to take him to his back. And he flipped his, man, he flipped and landed, man. I was like, dude, you are a freak. And just, Dave was like over there going, oh my God, oh my God, what was that? What was that? And so, yeah, he, but you know, he was, a, he was a gymnast. And that, and so his balance was just uncanny. I mean, his balance was amazing, right? And, and so that's what really made him really good, too. That was kind of the difference between him and Dave. Dave, and Dave were giving fits. Dave was technical and, and intelligent and, and sly and slick. Not, you know, he had some, he had better technique. Mark was a better athlete. You know, Mark was a better athlete. Mark was, was faster, had better balance. Um, 
but he just didn't have the he didn't have the technical uh, awareness that Dave had. Were they similar in personality? Oh, uh, you know, Dave was more outgoing. Mark was Mark was pretty. Um, he was a loner. He stayed to himself. You know, I mean, we were at the trials and he walked past us, wouldn't say anything. You know, he he was he was he was Dave was more outgoing. Dave would go and talk to anybody. You know, he'd talk to anybody. Right? And Lee Kemp told me the story, right? You know, Dave wrestled, you know, he wrestled at Oklahoma State his freshman year in college. No right? wonder. I don't even remember. That's crazy. He went to yeah, Oklahoma yeah, State first. Yeah. He got Shit. third, yep. Out of, out of high school. So he, he was wrestling Lee Kemp from Wisconsin in the dual meet, right? So they're wrestling. And they're, they're getting, they're warming up to wrestle. <laughs> Lee told me he's warming up and all of a sudden looks up. And Dave was like standing next to him, like, "Hey, Lee, what's going on?" You know that shit doesn't happen. That stuff don't happen, right? You don't do that in the dual meet when you got two teams and it's a big dual meet, big match. He looks over, and Dave was over, like, "Hey, Lee, like, how you doing, man? You know, <laughs> look forward to wrestling." Yeah, he's like, Martin Dave was like, dude, Lee was like, dude, get out, get out of here, right? <laughs> but that was just kind of Dave's deal, man. He just didn't, he didn't trip like that. You know, he would talk to anybody, he talked to his competitors, he talked to. He would talk to me, you know, and I would try to blow him off too, you know. And he he he'd come talk to me, but but that but that was and people see that as he's in my corner in Tbilisi when in Tbilisi tournament he was in my corner. Um, Coaching, of course, he was in my corner. Yep, he's in my corner for, and he asked me, he asked me, well, he asked Bobby Douglas first, what, if if I would allow him to be in my corner in the finals in the in the eighty Olympic, Olympic games. And um, then he came and, and Bobby came and asked me and, and I, I allowed him to be in my, my corner. But it wasn't because he was like my coach. He wasn't like coaching me at training camp or anything like that. You know, he would he would ask if, if he could do anything or we'd work out a couple of times at Olympic training camp in 88. But he wasn't like my coach or anything. He just happened to ask to be in my corner that day. Mm-hmm. You know, and he'd wrestle, of course, he had wrestled with Ryan and you know, that whole thing. So I thought it'd be, a, it'd be cool to have him looking at shows too, so. It worked yeah. out. <laughs> now, would you say, you know, in 88, if someone would have asked you who your coach was, would you have said Bobby or like a Joe C? Or who, who would you have said was your main coach? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I didn't really have – well, I didn't have a main coach. You know, I think Joe was Joe was the head coach at Oklahoma State, right? Mm-hmm. And Joe was a great guy. Joe was – he'd give you the shirt off his back. So, any mean, anything that I needed, right, to be in a room or if I had something that, that I say, hey, Joe, what do you think about this? He would he would give his opinion or whatever, but he wasn't like 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 today coaching me every day or you know setting up my workouts or setting up my plan. It wasn't none of that. He mm-hmm. was just he was really more concerned about the the, the college program. Uh, of course, we won eighty nine and ninety as a team. Um, but but as far as my coach, he wasn't really my coach. Now, once we got to the Olympic training camp, each wrestler had a coach assigned to him. And then Bobby was my coach during training camp. Got it. So he was, yeah, he was, he was, he was my coach, and he would, um, he would be in my practices, and he would say whatever he needed to say, and that kind of thing. So Bobby was 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 my coach, and and he sat in my corner, cornered me every match, and that kind of thing. So I would say Bobby, and and Bobby was a big influence anyway. Uh, but Bobby, my older brother Mike Michael Monday was graduated in 1974, and he went there as on the state. Bobby, he was Bobby's first recruit. And so that was my first real introduction to Bob to Bobby because when my brother went to school there. And then of course I went out there one one year, I think I was in the sixth or seventh grade, went out to one of the camps. So I was around Bobby a little bit during that time and learned a lot from him growing up. You know, just from my brother. My brother came back with with amazing technique from Bobby and I would pick that up. And then he had a book that he, you know, she I heard uh She's talking about that book that, that Bobby gave, The Making of a Champion. Um, that was an incredible book that Bobby Douglas put out, right? The Making of a Champion. And um, but the it's amount funny, of people coach, that, that mention that though, like it, it's sheets. It's like it's yeah. at least I don't know once every month, once every quarter. Someone's like, "Oh yeah, I saw a Bobby Douglas tape," and that he was like yeah. the original entrepreneur, you know, before right. all this stuff. Oh yeah, Bobby had a Bobby had a, a mind of wrestling that was unmatched by anyone I've ever seen in the sport. He, his mind for wrestling was incredible. I mean, just just, just his, his technique, his um, his methods, his concepts, 
Yeah, Bobby Bobby was, was definitely one of the best in the business when it came to wrestling. Yeah. For sure. He he's a you know, he was a tough guy too. You know, he was a hard ass to a lot of his guys, and, and they would say it that they were almost a little scared of him. Did you ever feel that, or are you more of like on an equal I level didn't. with them? Yeah, I did because I, of course, I was a, at that point, I was a man, so he wasn't. When I started dealing with Bobby, he, he did that with my brothers, and, and they left. They left, <laughs> they left Arizona State and, and transferred to OU. And so, <laughs> and so when it came down to recruit me, Bobby called me. I'm like, Bobby, I'm not coming to Arizona State. You know, I'm not doing that, right? And so yeah, I wasn't going to Arizona State, but yeah, he, um, but I, I, I didn't experience it just because once I, once I was out of college, you know, it was just, you know, it was just, uh, it, it was a respect thing. And I, and I actually, and to be honest, I went, actually went to Arizona State when I finished at Oklahoma State because Joe Chesbro got fired. Joe Sabre was a new coach. I went to Arizona State. I was at Arizona State 85 and 86 and some of 87. Then I came back to, to Stillwater, and then mm-hmm. me and that's when me and she started bumping heads. You know, we, that's when we really kind of got together. I convinced him to come out. Well, I don't know if I convinced him, but I'm like, I was part of it. Like, come on, man, she's come on, man, let's let's go do this thing, right? Because we were great partners in in college. I mean, he was my best college, my most my best workout in college, all the way up. Yeah, from yeah, we were also in high school, but after that, we we were we were best best workout partners in college. And so I knew he was going to, he brought out the best of me in that room. I can't even sure. imagine those workouts. And yeah, it was the, crazy. what was it like? Um, I know you never wrestled for Joe C at, in college, obviously, but you were around him a lot. How would yeah. you compare um, Ches bro and Joe C? You know, Je- Joe was, uh, Joe loved the game. Joe was, was, he loved freestyle. The biggest difference was Joe was in the freestyle. Mm. Joe loved freestyle. Chesbro hated freestyle. He had nothing to do with freestyle. That's probably why I never wrestled freestyle in the summer. And the summer came, you didn't see Chesbro. He was he, he was gone. You know, he was doing fishing or hunting or camps. He never did freestyle. Joe was all about freestyle. So that was the biggest difference. Joe loved the world stage. Um, and he was good at it. You know, so he, yeah, yeah. So Joe was Joe was a more of a freestyle coach. And um, and Joe kind of let you do your thing too. I mean, Ch- Chesbro was. Chesbro was a better folk style coach, right? He came from the school of Myron, Myron Roderick. Um, and so all of his, you know, high crotch, his elbow controls, fireman's carries, um, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. That's, that's what Chesbro taught. Um, and, and Joe was more of a freestyle wrestler. And um, so that was, that was the main difference with those two guys that and I saw. Sheets tells me that, and a lot of guys from that era, but like Chesbro was, a taskmaster drill guy. Like you were going to drill yeah. and everyone was going to yeah. do it. Where I see with like Kendall Cross describes it kind of like a workshop in there. You'd come in and some guys would be yep. off in a corner doing their thing. And it's kind of yep. on, on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had great, we, we, yeah. And we had great people in the room. I mean, I, when I, I trained, I, I trained a lot of those guys. Chris Barnes was a two time national champ, but he was probably one of my main workout partners. I stayed on Chris, you know, the only time his senior year, the only people who were taking him down was me. He didn't give up a takedown his whole senior year. In college. To me, in, in college. He didn't give up one takedown his whole senior year. Never. Man. But in the, but in the practice room. I'd kick his butt. Then he'd go out and he'd kick their butt. Um, I mean, Chiefs would kick his butt. But so, uh, yeah, Joe was Joe was really more open. He didn't, he wasn't as controlled. He was, he let us coach a lot. You know, we did, we did a lot of coaching. Um, and so, yeah, he was, he was really open when he came to that. He wasn't like, uh, the Chesbro was in control. Like he, you know, he, he ran you through drills, ran you through drills, ran you through drills. Yeah, he was he was he was a little different guy. Joe was more open and um, and, and and made a difference. Man, right? he, he let us do a lot of coaching. You know, I I did the same thing when I went to Bobby. You know, they won a they won a national title in 1988. Mm-hmm. Those are my a lot of those guys are my guys because when I came from Oklahoma State, I came with a lot of those drills, mm-hmm. a lot of the Chesbro drills, a lot of Myron Rogers drills, a lot of those things. And so I worked with a lot of those guys on the Arizona State team, and they won a title in '88. <laughs> I came back '87. They won in '88 in Arizona State, and then Oklahoma State wins '89 and '90. Yeah. Right? And so I had a I had a hand in all those those titles. <laughs> wow. Tell yeah. me about the difference of going to the Olympics for the first time in '88 and how it compared yeah. when you went back in '92. Uh, 
yeah, I, I think it's kind of hard to to explain. I think the biggest difference I think for me is I I wasn't I, I didn't have a real good workout situation because I left Oklahoma State in 1992. I came, I moved to Tulsa, got married, um, and I had taken off a few years. And I took off '93, took off '94, wrestled a little bit in '94, took off '95. Um, and then came back and made the team in 96. And so I just wasn't as, as consistent with my, my training. So I didn't feel as good um, mm-hmm. for in 96 that I did in, in 90, 90, 98, 92. 92, I felt really good. And I just I hurt my elbow, you know, before the tournament started. But I think, yeah, the biggest part was just, um, for me, it was just that consistency of my training. Because I, I, we had left, I had left Tulsa, and we had a training camp set up in Arizona. Arizona State. So Joe was out there. And, and so Sunkiss uh, put together a training camp at a had us apartments and places for her to train. And, and so we went out there to train um, during that time. Well, and from so, what I hear that, that the, the pull you had to make at 96 to get down to weight was like historic. I mean, that was like a brutal pull. I mean, how, how bad were you coming <laughs> down for that one in 96? Um, yeah, it, it got better. I mean, once I, you know, I, I was up, I was, got pretty heavy, but then once I got down, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty controlled, you know, it wasn't too, wasn't too bad once I got it down. Um, and I actually had a pretty good, pretty good um, Olympic trials final, you know, I guess, I guess uh, Pat Smith. I was pretty, I had a pretty good, two, two really good matches. I just, I hurt my knee and people don't know this either, but I was playing, we were playing basketball, me and Kevin and Melvin Douglas and all of us, we were playing basketball and I, I go for a rebound. I just told myself about this, he didn't even know. I come, I come down on her for a rebound and landed on one leg and, and my knee kind of buckled. I tore my ACL, right? No. And so I didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I couldn't run after that really. And I was, I'm a big runner, right? when I'm training. And so I just couldn't get the running in like that. So I really, I just wasn't in the kind of shape that I needed to be for 96. I just couldn't run. And I got, I got surgery right after, right after the tournament. Um, so I just wasn't physically, I wasn't as ready in 96 as I was in the other, other tournaments. Now, were you at, were you in Stillwater at all when, when Pat was kind of coming into his zone and did you guys have any workouts ahead of time before that 96 trials? No, no, I, you know, of course, I was in when when Pat came to Oklahoma State, right? Um, you know, I was in the room. I didn't leave until '93, so the first his freshman year and his I think his freshman year and sophomore year I was in his red red shirt year and freshman year I was there. We worked out a lot. I worked out with Pat a lot, you know, and um, but I didn't. But then because I left in '93, and then so then he was he was around, so I didn't really get to work out too much with him after that. After I left. Um, and then maybe I would come, I came back maybe a couple of times in 94, you know, maybe 93, 94, came back a couple of times and, and kind of worked out with it a little bit. Um, so it was really, it wasn't, wasn't real comfortable when we had to wrestle, <laughs> you know, really. I bet. Yeah, it was almost like a little brother, you know, and I, and I worked out, and like, like I said, when he was young, I worked out with him a lot in the room and taught him a lot. You know, of course I was close with the Smith family and. I remember before I wrestled Pat in the finals, his dad came and Leroy came up to me and said, you take it, take it easy on my boy. <laughs> you take it easy on my boy. I was like, Leroy, I'm the old man. You need to take it easy on me. <laughs> but yeah, I love I loved that family. I love his mom, Madeline. You know, the first time I met them, I was, I think I was in the seventh grade and I uh, made a, a junior um, Oklahoma national team and went in the training campus at Oklahoma City. And so they had parents and that was housing some of the kids that were on the team. And the, the, I, I, the Smiths opened their house to me. And so I went and stayed with them for the weekend. And that was the first time I met John. I think he was like probably 10 years old, nine or 10 years old, little brat running around, just a little honorary brat running around. Crazy little kid. What was Leroy like back then? Leroy was the man. Now, Leroy was the man. And, and the Monday Smith legacy goes way back because he my brother Jim used to wrestle Leroy wrestled in the state tournament a couple times and um so I, I first learned about them and they first learned about us because Jim and Leroy wrestled and that's and Leroy was tough man Leroy was tough I learned a lot from him as well um he beat Jim in the, in the state tournament 
beat my brother in the state tournament. And then Jim beat him in a freestyle tournament. It was a tournament, freestyle tournament to qualify to go to Japan. Then Jim beat Leroy off that team, made that team went to Japan. And so it was already, it was some rivalry going back back then. But when I came to, when I came in 84, Leroy was training for, no, I'm sorry. When I came in 80, and, and Leroy was around a little bit, but then he left. But then he came back in 84 to train for the Olympics. And that was my senior year. That's a, that's a historic so, Olympic yeah. trials. Yeah. Yeah, it was, man. It really was. Yeah. They're in the, in the drawer. Be careful, my car, son. <laughs> so let's, let's get but, into the. Yeah. We got Kenny's doing dad duties here. We're doing a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So 84, 84 is maybe one of the most historic years ever in terms of Iowa, Oklahoma State, yeah. you know. Gang Gable involved. So you have yeah. the you have the epic dual meet in Stillwater. We talked about last time where Oklahoma State crushed Iowa. J Rob was You're the right. coach. Leroy yeah. and Gable land. They get in from Tbilisi and the yeah. Hawks get blown out. Yeah. You guys go to nationals, supposed to win it. You guys get second. Chesbro gets yeah. fired as the coach of yeah. the year. Yeah. And then that that summer in June, Leroy and Randy have have an Olympic trials that yeah. that's yeah, it works. Probably the most debated of all time. What yeah. do you remember from all that? It was crazy. It was really crazy because, yeah, I mean, Chesbro, we were, we're, and it was a lot of pressure on Chesbro. You could feel it, right? Because we beat Iowa two years in a row in the duels, beat him in 83 uh, duel, beat him in 84 duel. And we knew a lot was right. And Myron Roger was, was the athletic director, and he had a lot of pressure on Chesbro, right? And so we were trying to win, and we should have won. We should have won. It definitely we should have won our, my, my senior year. So there was a lot of pressure with that. And then, uh, you know, John was kind of like me. He was seated third or fourth going into the national tournament. Got beat second round. That kid gets beat. John gets knocked out of the tournament. So he didn't, he didn't win a match for us. Maybe one match. I think he won his first match. Uh, but didn't really score any points on us. And we ended up losing by maybe four or five points. So that was a tough one. And then after that, yeah, yeah Cheswell gets fired. And then uh, – were you guys so all shocked by that, or are you kind of expecting it? Well, we we kind of expected it just because it was a lot of talk, right? Myron and, and Chesbro wasn't getting along. And, um, I mean, they were it was so crazy. There would be banners. There would be airplanes flying over the football games with fire Chesbro. And I don't know where that came from. What? Right? Yes. It was, it, was a, it was planes would fly over the football game. And it would in, in a couple of banners that it would say fire Chesbro. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Holy yeah. smokes. <laughs> and so there was a lot going on, a lot going on, a lot of pressure on, on Chesbro. And he was a great guy, great coach. You know, Coach John, uh, Coach Leroy. Um, but we should have won. We should we should have won. The guys just didn't had a couple guys, and I heard Sheets talk about it too. A couple guys didn't have good tournaments and, and we end up losing, but but you know, of course, Iowa was, you know, they were they were the referee's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, yeah, and then that, then that, after that, then then um, yeah, then that happened with Leroy and Randy, and that was that was a mess. That was a tough one, you know. So yeah, I uh, I was I, I had a I I released an episode that I did with Royce for the the Smith thing, and he yeah. was uh, he was like I was just a freshman in '84, and I drove down with Rico, yeah. and we slept in a truck, and he was yeah. saying. Uh, he said he always wore cowboy hats to those duels. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, Royce was a, he was a character. He was a character. And, and, and um, he was tough. And then, you know, Chipperelli was, Chipperelli came and stayed with me for a couple months after I won in 89. Like I won 89. He's like, I'm coming to Stillwater. Him, him and Chris Campbell came to train with me. Two Iowa boys came to train with me in Stillwater. After I'm so I won glad you brought up Chris Campbell, man, because we're, I'm going to, I'm finally getting him on the podcast in two weeks. I saw that. I saw that. Tell me about, I mean, for the generation who they hear the name Chris Campbell don't know about it, what kind of impact did he have on all you guys coming up in that time when he came back in 92? Yeah, Chris was Chris was an incredible guy, right? Incredible guy. And, of course, as a kid, I watched him in Iowa and watched him win. And, you know, just being a, you know, a, a black wrestler, you kind of identify with, of course, all the black wrestlers coming up before you. Of course, I had him and Lee Kemp and Carl Adams and um, Jimmy Johnson and, you know, all those guys I paid, I paid attention to, of course. Um, but, yeah, Chris was amazing. So he calls me up. 
after I beat the Zion, right? I mean, probably the next week, he calls me up Monday. Dude, you beat Fazai. That's incredible. He's, he's all going all about it. He's like, man, that was amazing. Blah, blah, blah. You're the man. Dude, I'm, I'm fired. You got me fired up. I'm coming back. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm coming back. Are you coming back? Yeah, I want to wrestle. I want to wrestle. I want to wrestle. And uh, I'm coming to Stillwater. And so <laughs> two weeks later, he shows up at Stillwater. Wow. <laughs> he came to train. Yeah, he came to train and uh, ended up making the 90 team. Made the 90 team. And then the 91 team and the 92 team. Yeah, so he came back and we, we trained a lot. We trained a lot between uh, when, when he came back after 89. Uh, we, we, I, he would come to Stillwater. I'd go to New York and train with him some. He's living there. And, wow. and um, yeah, I learned a lot from him. Man. He was he an was incredible, incredible guy. That 92 yeah. team was filthy. Because didn't Carr go down to make that team? No, that was an eighty-eight. That was eighty-eight when 88. he went down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I beat, I beat him. The last time we wrestled was in that eighty-seven World Team Trials. I beat him two straight. Beat him pretty convincing. I, 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 I'd pass him at that point, right? I was, I was, I had my eyes on Schultz. And so after the tournament, we were hanging out. And I go, Dave. I said, Nate, man, you need to go down, go down to forty-nine, and um, and get out of my way. Let me focus on Schultz, and we both make the team. And he's, no, no, you go down, you go down. And then uh, a couple weeks later, he calls me up and said, "All right, man, I'm going down." So yeah, he went down, and then he then we trained together. So he came. That was eighty, yep, yeah, 80, 80, after eighty seven World Team Trials. That next year, he uh, he came down to Stillwater, and we trained together. And he, he made the team. Went down to forty nine, beat Metzger, and Metzger was the guy, right? In forty nine mm-hmm. for 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 you for a few years. Metzger was tough. I wrestled Metzger in college. He he was one of the best guys I've ever wrestled. And um, really, and so they, yeah. Oh, and then Mesco was one of the best guys ever else for sure. He's wow. Tough. He's so tough. who was who was the that guy in '92? Then was it Townsend Sanders or was that '96? Like that for me? No, no. Who's that? Like that forty nine oh, pounder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, and yeah, it was Townsend. Townsend came up right. So Townsend came up through the ranks. I remember I was I spent some time with Townsend when I went to Arizona. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he and he just kind of came up through the ranks, man, and, and kind of. End up making jumping levels, and him and Zeke were training together too, you know. So I think Bobby had him, and uh, did Bobby have him or did Leroy have? Him? I think I don't. I can't remember. Be, I think Bobby would. Had I think to be Bobby, Bobby I would coach. think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Bobby was a coach. So he just kind of came up through the ranks, man. He was hungry, and I got to I got to spend some time with him when I was in Arizona, and uh, kind of showed him some things. And look, man, you this is what you do, you know. And, and uh, he picked up, you know, picked up some things, and yeah, he ended up being the guy. I like they. I like. I don't think Carr made the team again after eighty eight. Oh no, no. I'm sorry. He made ninety. He made ninety. He made the ninety team. Did he make eighty nine? No, he didn't make eighty nine. He made the ninety team. He got beaten eighty nine, and he, and he came back in eighty and ninety made the team. And I think that was his last team he made. Yeah, I know so many, so many studs back then. Oh I wonder- yeah. Dude, it's crazy to hear about. It. I mean, because then '96, you had another great team, and then we kind of went through a little bit of a dip, you know, for about yeah, yeah. you know 10, 15 years 10 as years, a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah at least. Yeah. Um, because I'm doing yeah. a a piece now on Henry Cejudo, and yeah. uh, it'll be live in April, but April or May. But he, um, you right. know, when he won in '08. He's the only medalist for freestyle. I know it. I know it. We were struggling. I think a lot of it was just because of. I don't know. I think it was the athletes. I think we had we had a different level of athletes coming through because our 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 generation came and we we were on the shoulders of of greatness, right? And once we retired, those guys just you know they just for for the reason they just now we didn't have good guys coming through there. So, well, you guys had that, that level. You guys had that seventy two team to look up to, and that's yeah, one of the best exactly. teams ever. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's what that's what did it to me. I was exposed to greatness, but they had some guys that. It came before them. I, I just think I, I don't know. I think it was a dip. I think a lot of a lot of the older coaches got out of it. I don't think Gable wasn't coaching. Douglas wasn't coaching. Uh, Jay Robbins wasn't coaching. Wick wasn't coaching. So I think it was a dip in dip in coaches, and, and then yeah. we were kind of going through our transition, and I not really coaching. So they, I don't think they had the coaching that they could have had coming through. So yeah. Well, it's it's awesome to see where we're at now. I mean, we're witnessing greatness. We get Jordan Burroughs, you know unbelievable what he's doing we got so many guys and it's so deep 
You know, you right. look at what happened at the Zagreb tournament two weeks ago. We had some, yeah. we had a lot of guys there. And yeah. oh yeah, oh, man, yeah. It, it's fun. And I hope Russia gets yeah. back in there. And yeah, yeah I know, man. That's so sad. It's so sad. I was just talking to, well, I was talking to someone last night about about Russia and not thinking, not knowing if they're going to be at the World Championship this year or oh yeah, I was talking to one of my sponsors, from Morgan State, and I was telling them about the, you know just the the the, the the you know Olympics coming up in 24 and then 28 it's in LA so I'm yeah. trying to get them on board I'm trying to get them on board for you know to get behind some of our guys so Quincy being one of them uh, to get behind him to get ready for 24 and 28 and so yeah we're talking about Russia not not knowing if they're going to even be there which that would be sad because there's always an asterisk by your name if the Russians aren't if you win it and the Russians aren't there just like in '84 if you, it's you don't, not you even our Go, I was gonna say it's not even our athletes' fault, but like to the, it's gonna yeah, be no, a mark on them. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. unfortunately, just like uh, you know, I mean, eighty four, eighty four. But I was also thinking in, 80, in 20, 80. eighty, and then in, in twenty one when they had that World Championships a month yeah. after the Olympics. Right. It's like, right? It's a world. Right. Yes, it is. Of course, it's an right. amazing thing, but you know, it's it's not the same. And you know, the worlds before yeah. an Olympics like this year, this is what determines the Olympics. So that Russia's right. got to be in this year. We got to make. Right. Hopefully, it makes That's it happen. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it would be it would be a sad thing if they're not there because we know they're the, they're 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 some of the best ever, and they're gonna have a strong team, and they always do, and they always bring out the best in us. Um, I would hate for them not to be in the in the tournament. I would hate it. I would hate that. And it's just it's yeah. just not a true Olympic Games, right? It's just not. It's just it's just not. And we need the Dake Sidakov match. We've been deprived of that match, <laughs> and it's not right. right. I don't know why they're right, doing that to us. Right, I mean, right. back in your era, yeah. you guys would have had three duels by now. Yeah, no doubt. Exactly. That's the thing. We, Yeah, we'd have dual meet. I was just telling the sponsor about that, too. I'm like, we used to do dual meet, bring the Russian team in. Dude, we, we, would, I would, we would have sellout arenas, right? It's so sad to see these, these gyms now, but we bring a Russian team over, and it would be sold out. I mean, it would be packed at the, at the places when you have a Russian USA team. And that's how – competitive was and people would want to see it but the Russians would come over to USA we'd go over there but the, but the, the the matches here would be sold out when we wrestled the Russian team and when you went to Russia would there be a lot of fans there too yeah oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah absolutely I mean big fans I mean, they, I mean they're I mean they're some of the best fans in, in the world of course Iran you know Iran's got got crazy fans kind of like Iowa you know yeah but, but Russians Russians show up they do show up did you wrestle quiet. in They're that not... event in Pittsburgh? The... I did. Twice. Who did you wrestle there? The first time I wrestled the guy uh from Russia. He was he was the guy. He had made the team. And then the second time I wrestled the Bulgarian um, world champion from 1990. Um, I can't forget. That's a fun yeah, uh, event, though. Oh, uh, dude! I won twenty five thousand both years in a row. Right, so if you get ten thousand to wrestle and win, and then I got the outstanding wrestler both years, <laughs> and so I got an extra ten grand, right? And so it was so crazy because if you didn't score, you didn't get paid. And so the guy I wrestled from Bulgaria, <clears throat> I shut him out, and at the end of the match, he's like asking me to asking me to let him score, <laughs> and I didn't let him score. But if I would have let him score, I wouldn't have got the old W. That I wouldn't have got the old W. That. You know, so I couldn't let him score. So you didn't get paid at all if you didn't score. No, you didn't get paid. <laughs> you didn't get paid. It, I man. bought him dinner after that, though. <laughs> I bought him dinner and his drinks for the rest of the night. <laughs> man, and like you know how much you know as well as anyone how much more money's in the sport now. You got to think that we could pull off an event like that and we actually get Sajulayev, get right. the best guys, and if it's Yazdani, whoever it is, because yeah. you think about that. That year you had, I don't know. What year John and Sergey wrestled? Um, that was the second year. That was in 89, I think. That was 89 or 90. It was 89 or 90. 89, okay. I think. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, I mean, look, I mean, hell of a, hell of a match. you're hell of a in match. there. Yeah. Bruce is in there. I mean, those were some yep. hammers. Yep. Yep. No, we could, we could, we could do some amazing, amazing matches, but you know, those guys won. I mean, it's just a different time now. Those guys are getting paid. Back then, <clears throat> they weren't getting paid like they are getting paid now on either side. Either side, you mm -hmm. know, the, you know, the Burroughs and, and the Dakes, these guys are making more money than, of course, we made. And then in Russia, 
they're making tons more money than they made just because now it's open. It's wide open. Uh, back then, KGB was like they had they were capped of what they could do. I mean, those guys were poor, man. They were really poor back then. They didn't have internet. <clears throat> they couldn't. They could buy. I mean, they had they had no jeans. <laughs> I took jeans to Russia in '87 and '88 and sold them to them. They were just like all over me, like like blue you know, jeans. Blue jeans. <laughs> they they didn't have malls. They didn't have malls. They didn't have stores. It wasn't open. It wasn't a free market, right? Yeah. And so they would buy stuff from us, like tennis shoes, uh, warm ups. I mean, they didn't have a lot. Of the, the base guys didn't have anything. Wow. And so they would they would be all over our suitcases, man. It was crazy. We had like a store in your, in your room selling <laughs> Nikes and stuff, right? Black market. Where's my mom? Take off. I got. What time uh, you coming back? No problem. What time you coming? What you mean, Kabaran? Okay. All right, go ahead, John. You shouldn't. What time is it? Yeah, back five. <clears throat> All right, go ahead, Kabaran. Sorry. No problem. I was just wanted to just wind down last fifth. Five minutes or so. Tell me about Morgan State and how this all came about. Because I saw you out in Ohio. It sounded yeah. like a great opportunity. Yeah. And then uh... it was a great opportunity. It was really good. I, I enjoyed it. I really did. So what? You're sitting at home <clears throat> one day and you get a call, or what happened? How are you at Morgan State? Well, <clears throat> well, I mean, I was on the committee. To of course, I was on the BWA committee, and so we we started talking about trying to get a program back at an HBCU, and it came up. And of course, you know, everything was going on, you know, social injustices, things were going on. So we're trying to figure out man, how can we empower our new generation, our next generation? How can we do this? How can we help? How can we make a difference um, in, in, in our world today, in America, in our, in our uh, young black kids coming up? And so we just started talking about it, right? Start talking about it. Um, got Novogratz involved, and, and, and he kind of started pushing the idea like, look, I we we need we need a program back in one of these HBCUs, right? And I guess the last time that Morgan State had a program was in I remember when it dropped. It was nineteen ninety six. I was getting ready for the Olympic Games, and the news came down that Morgan State was dropping a program. And I knew the coach. I would see the coach, you know, uh, Coach Phillips, James Phillips. I would see him around, you know, when I was coming through. He'd he'd always come up and talk to me. He was such a nice guy. He'd come up and give me a hard time. Tell me I should come to Morgan State, yeah. And so, um, but I liked him. I liked him. I respect him. And so I was. I felt bad when it when it happened. Um, and so we started talking about that. And I was I was talking to the the Howard University's athletic director. I, I had a friend that knew him, and we were trying to get to their interest there. Hampton. I mean, just some of the different different HBCUs. Morgan State was on the table, and Morgan State showed the. They showed the most interest in, in allowing it to happen. And mm -hmm. so when Nova guys came and said, hey, I got, I'm going to donate $3 million to the program, then down the program, you know, what, what can we do? And so we started talking to Morgan. They showed interest. They like, okay. And then it started moving forward. Like right? Kerry McCoy was on it. Uh, Jai was on it. Um, he was on the, on the call. So the committee was really trying to push it, right? I wasn't even thinking. I, I, I never, to be honest, I had never really wanted to be a college coach. I like, you know, I was kind of more in the freestyle. When it, we went through that whole deal in, in 91 with Joe Say, the, the uh, NCAA violation, and Joe got turned upside down. And we won, we won two in a row. We would have won five, six in a row. To yeah. Be honest with you. Yeah. From, 90, from 89, John ended up winning again in 93, four or three. But we had the team with Alan Freed and the Perlers. We'd have won. We'd have had a stretch. And then that hit. And I'm we watching. I watched it. And it was like he's treating these kids like criminals. And to turn Joe's, he wins 89 and 90, gets fired. He had just built a brand new crib, gets fired. And he's on the top of the world. And now he's he's a criminal. Like they treated him like a criminal. That had to so hit I'm him hard. It. Oh, dude, I'm watching it. And it and it screwed up our team, right? And 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 John and I, we were co-head coaches in '92. Isn't that the craziest thing you've ever heard? Like the yeah, fact you guys we were, were training. We were, we were training, and all of a sudden, it gets thrown on our laps. No coach, 
Dave Martin was athletic, one of the athletic directors, throws on our lap, said, you guys run the team. We ran the team. And we did a pretty good job. But we ran a team as co-head coaches in that year, 92. And then, so while, watching that, I was like, man, I, I just really don't want to do this. I, you know, so kind of kind of soured me about being a college coach. And so I really didn't want to do it. And so we can't, so we got to this point. Right now, I'm the freestyle, I'll be the RTC coach, whatever. I've been in the program. I've, you know, I've been around John, his freestyle coach, and, of course, Coleman, his freestyle coach. And so I've been around the program for a while and watching these guys. But when it came down to it, Ryan, when it came down to it, and I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it. We had guys that were like in their final interviews. Nate Parker in Novogratz kind of came back and said, Monday, give this another thought. Give it another thought. I think it would be big, a bigger impact if, if you take the job. And if you, because we know what you're capable of doing, right? We know who you are, right? You know, really take a look at this, you know. And so then I, because at first, when they first asked me, would I be interested? I think it made sense, you know, first Black Olympic champion coming back, you know, I think it kind of made sense from the start. But I really wasn't interested. And I had just taken a job at Spire, just left UNC. That was at UNC for five years mm-hmm. with Coleman. And enjoying that time and had a, had a good run there. You know, put Jordan on the team and we had a good run. And, um, and so I really wasn't looking. And, and went to Spire, was, I think, was a great opportunity. Uh, incredible deal. Ray Lewis turned me on to that. And so, but when they came back and I took a deeper dive at it, I'm like, man, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And I, and I want to I wanna help it, you know. And so then they, they kind of came back and, and kind of sold me on it. And then that's kind of how, how we got there. So they came back and it's like in the midnight hour. Kind of wow. the midnight hour. Yeah. And then Nate, Nate came back and Nate Parker. I don't even know Nate Parker, but Nate uh-uh. is um yep, he's a, he and Nate was a rap. He's a he was a film producer. Now he's an actor and he's got some great films out there. He did he did um uh American Skin, he did the Red Red Tails, uh the Great Debaters. You you Google this guy. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a very, very accomplished actor, uh, very accomplished producer. And so him and Novogratz are, are really good friends. Novogratz, I think. Kind of, um, kind of supported him in his movie. One of the movies, the last I think one of the last movies he did. He, I think Noah Grassman was a, was the, uh, the resources behind that. So they they became close. And so Noah Grass kind of threw it to Nate, and Nate, of course, he he's a wrestler. He wrestled back in the day. Started at Penn State, and then he went to OU. Um, but then Nate came back to me and, and really kind of convinced me to to. Take the take the job and, and and bring it back. So Nate really kind of got under my skin. <laughs> he kind of got under my skin. And again, he's a movie. I've been trying to get the dude to do my movie. So right, that's how Nate and I was kind of became talking because I was trying to get him to do the Kenny Monday story, right? Like Nate, you're a wrestler. You can do this story. It's a great story. And I think I was getting I was getting inducted into the um, UWW Hall of Fame. I was trying to get Nate to come with me. So he can kind of film it and, and, and do do my story, and um, and so we're still working on it. So he was like, "Yeah, yeah, Monday. This this is a part of that story. This is part of that story." Wow. And so he kind of, yep, he kind of got to me and said, "Man, let's let's do this thing." So, so you guys are gonna do you're gonna do your first season next year, right? Twenty three, twenty four. Yep, yep. First season is the fall of twenty three. I just signed. I got probably about fifteen kids signed already. Uh, I got some really good kids coming. Um, and I think we're going to surprise some people. You what know, division is it? It's D one. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, no, we're Division one. We're Division one. Awesome. And uh, yeah, we're Division one. And so uh, no, we're our first tournament will probably be you know we'll, we'll probably be at the Princeton Open and then we're going to Vegas for the Cliff Keen Open. And um, I love I had, it. Yeah, Esposito called me the other day and said Monday I got this this choir we're trying to put together for the Hall of Fame. The only wants us to come back and, and be a part of that. So it's been great, right? Just because, man, I'll tell you what, all over the world, I've had people call me or message me or text me and and and, um, and so excited about uh, Morgan State and its wrestling and bringing it back. And of course, as wrestlers, we never want to see a program drop. Never. It broke my heart to see Fresno drop, right? I know the athletic director. I grew up with the athletic director at Fresno State. Guy lived two blocks from me growing up. No shit. 
Yeah, yeah. So I know him. And so I went out there after he, he they brought the Cobra and brought him back. Steiner calls me and said, Monday, I just met um, Terry Toomey. He's an athletic director. I just met him. I'm like, yeah, that's my, my homeboy. I grew up with him. So I went out there for the coaches clinic. Got to hang out with him, went to the football game. Everything is good. He loved, and he loved it. He wrestled in high school a little bit in my high school. He went to my high school. Wow. Ended up going there. Yep, went to UCLA, played football, went pro a little bit. And yeah, he's he's always been a smart guy. And and um, now he's an athletic director. So, so it broke our heart to see that happen uh, for sure after it came back. And so. Um, and they did the Steiners dirty yeah. out there, man. They tried to do them real. And you talk about the NCA having some issues. That's another situation yeah. where, you know, Terry Steiner or Troy, which one was out there? Troy. 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 But he's the, you know, he's, he's fantastic. I'm glad he's at Minnesota yeah. and would love to see him, uh, you know, back yeah. in the coaching ranks at yeah. some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's tough, man. It was, it's a tough deal because they were, they were doing a good job. They were doing a good job and they were going to, we need it. We need, well, we, we don't need any program to drop, you know, but they're out there in Fresno with, with the um, with the with the family, uh, Abbas family, not the Abbases, but um, the other family that's they they bankroll a lot of stuff. They work with um, with DC on their on their oh, stuff. Oh, uh, I know you're talking about um, Zinkin. Zinkin, Zinkin, exactly. Zinkin. They're out there yeah. with the Zinkins, and they got they got kids coming up, wrestlers coming up. They're a great wrestling family. That valley's um, a hotbed too. You got yeah. the Cal the Terrapelli boys reach coach in high right. schools. You got yeah, yeah that's a that's yeah, a great a lot of area. Good kids coming out. A lot of kids. You know, Zeke can't get all those kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he seriously. Can't get those kids. Man. And so that, yeah, yeah. Cal Poly's coming on. Cal Poly's trying to make a difference. But Pendleton's yeah, he, doing he, a good he, job too. He's getting yeah. a lot of those California yeah. kids. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because he was out in that area, right? So he's got he's got uh what's the name out there with him? Uh Munoz, Munoz, so you know, he's got a pipeline now. He's got a pipeline. So, yeah, it, it's always tough to see that happen, you know. So, but I'm, I, I know that Morgan State has got to be a sustainable program uh, to set the standard for everyone else. We're going to be the standard bearers. Uh, I know this game. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm my, I've mastered the sport of wrestling, um, and so I just got to get that support. And, and it, but it's been crazy, man. It's been crazy. Uh, I mean, when I first got the job, it was probably five hundred emails and messages from people all over the world. It's like nice. kids, parents, coach, I want to wrestle for an HBC. I've always wanted to wrestle for an HBC. And to be honest, coming out of college, you know, it, it wasn't, I, I don't think I was recruited. I was the number one recruit. But if I would have had probably someone like a Bobby Douglas or Carl Adams or Lee Kemp, say Lee Kemp was a, was a head coach at Morgan State at that time, I would have looked at it. Really? I would have looked at it. I might not have gone just because I'm an Oklahoma guy and yeah, I was going down to Oklahoma State a lot when I was a kid. I had, a, you know, uh, had some some love there, but I would have definitely paid attention. I would have definitely looked at it and say, Elite Kemp or Bobby Douglas was an HBU, HBCU. So what does that so mean, me HBCU? I mean, I know what the yeah. I know what the acronym means, but like, what does it actually mean? Like, what is it? Historical Black College University. And and how does like, how does the school Black get College. get that way? It's just through the tradition of the of the program, where there's a set number of them. Yeah, I mean, you go you go back and research. I mean, they're all over the country, you know. Okay. Fisk, you know, Fisk Howard, um, and then they're some of the best colleges out of uh, in the in the country. Um, you know, um, probably. I mean, seventy percent of uh, attorneys, black attorneys, come out of HBCU. HB, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would so be awesome just, to get a wrestling presence at all those. You know, we we we're going to have wrestling presence. You know, to be, to be honest, when I when I was a senior in college, I was already signed to Oklahoma State. Ricky Stewart was the national champion in I think it was seventy nine, yeah, seventy nine. And the guy he had in the finals was Bucky Smith from Morgan State. Wow. From Morgan State. Wow. Yeah. And I remember it. I remember going, man, who's he got in the finals? Yeah, watching the tournament. Oh, he's got the kid from Morgan State in the finals. So yeah, so Ricky beat a guy from Morgan State. Ricky was probably my probably one of my toughest workouts ever. This guy, I I had never had a, a, the baddest day I had in the wrestling room ever was with Ricky Stewart. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I stayed out one night. We had practice like on a Saturday morning. I went out with a lady friend. I came back and was out, you know, way too late. We had practice early the next morning. I was late for practice. Chess bro was pissed off. Puts me with Ricky. Ricky, that time I'm a 42 pounder. Ricky was a 58, 50, 58 pounder. 
Yeah, 58 pounder. And so he was bigger, stronger, strongest thing I've ever wrestled. And I had to go with him that next day. And he kicked my butt for like an hour, two hours straight. <laughs> just, just brutalized me. I mean, just told me to, to teach me a lesson. And, and he did. He, I never, that, I never did that again. <laughs> never did that again. I, I learned my lesson as a freshman. He kicked my butt for two hours. That was the oh, worst man. day of my life in the wrestling room, ever, <laughs> still to this day. <laughs> Ricky was man. strong. And then, of course, Ricky won the national title that year, and then he pinned Schultz in the finals the next year. Was he the guy yeah. who had a crazy fire, Vince? Like, what was his? Yeah, yeah, he did. That's he, right, he, yeah. Yeah, yeah, house caught on fire, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. man. Yeah. Well, Kenny, Ricky I'm was just... tough. Ricky was, he was a guy, and I tell you, I beat Nate. Nate was the defending champion my sophomore year. He won my freshman year. At 150. I went up to 150 my sophomore year, and I started, that's when I started wrestling Nacon. But I beat Nate, and the first, the first time we wrestled was in the dual meet in, in, Iowa, in Iowa State, and I beat him um, as a defending champ. And I knew I had confidence that I could do it because I was starting to kind of beat Ricky in the room. And so I was, I was I count Ricky, so I kind of get some last assessment, with him. I'm like, if I get this guy, I can beat Nate, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You said that uh, back in the day, Nate Carr was as good of a trash talker as there was. Is it true that he would do it on uh, the mat? Oh, yeah. He was the best. He was the best. He was – Nate, I beat him that year. I beat, the time I beat him in Iowa State, when the referee went to raise my hand, he raised his hand. <laughs> 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 he, was, he was funny, man. Then you pin him at the funny. Big Eights that year? I did pin him. I, pinned him in, I beat him. I pinned him in the Big Eights, yeah. Then lost to him in double overtime. In the, in the NCAA finals, yeah, yeah, man. he got two, got two titles from me. Wow, man, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. uh, interviewing KJ for the Henry Cejudo doc back in yeah, November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I was telling yeah. him, I go, I want to do a series called Rivals, right? And just do like mm -hmm. each episode on a different one. And uh, yep. I was with KJ, so I'm like, you versus Royce would be fun, just because yep. they're both great yep. storytellers. And he goes. Yep. If you do it, I only do it if you do Nate and Kenny, because that one right there is the all-time greatest. So I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, there's no yeah. problem there. I'd love to do that one. That's that's right. That's, right. We that's a way, documentary that needs to be told. Yep, absolutely. We brought, we brought up the best of each other, that's for sure. And uh, but you know, we were always we, we were cool off the mat. We 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 bang heads, and then of course after it was over, we'd be like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? And, uh, and then, you know, right. we, we it was never like a bitter enemy, bitter. You know, the same thing with Schultz. It was never bitter like afterwards. We we didn't like each other on the mat, but when it was over, it was over. And uh, we, and, and today, we'll, he, you know, of course, he, he, you know, we will give each other hugs when we see each other today. He just texted me the other day, but you know, of course, now our boys are, are in the same weight class, which is crazy. And so I yeah. know, right? And so I, my, you know, I love to see them lose, make the finals, and, and have have a, have a finals match. I love to see it. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Kenny. I'm glad we got to just share some stories and talk about all the awesome stuff you're doing at Morgan State yeah. and. Yeah, I look yeah, forward to uh, I will, man. I look forward to spread seeing the word, them. man. Spread the word, spread the word. Morgan State is back, and uh, we, we're going to make an impact. We're going to make an impact. I promise you. Awesome, man. I'll come up and say hi to you at the NCAA's this That'd year. Thanks great. again, man. That'd be great. All right, Ryan. Take care, buddy. Take care.